Alright, today we are going to specifically talk about the three types of chemical bonds, uh, covalent, ionic, and metallic. We've already introduced these, and as a review, um, covalent are going to be between nonmetals on the periodic table, ionic is going to be between a metal and a nonmetal, and metallic are going to be metals only. So again, that periodic table and knowing those differences is, is really crucial to um, being able to conceptualize this. All right, we've got molecules. We've seen this term several times, so hopefully by now it's in our brains. A molecule is a neutral group of atoms held together by covalent bonds, and again, this is where electrons are shared. Okay, and again, this is all non two nonmetals, which are the right of the stair step. So there again, just to emphasize that for about the 50th time this semester. Um, this is just some different representations um, of how we show the connections. When you see these overlapping ball and stick, these are kind of the electron clouds that overlap of different atoms and how those electron clouds are being shared. You also sometimes will see just a connection and then this is obviously a much larger molecule with um, several carbons and several hydrogens kind of all connected and maybe some oxygens I think in there as well. But anyway, different models that we have. Okay, diatomic molecule is a special type of molecule. This is molecules containing only two atoms. Okay, again we have the prefix of di and that's going to indicate two. This time it's going to be a molecule only containing two atoms. Now there are several naturally occurring diatomic elements. You need to know these. This is just one of those memorizational fact things. And see there's your know these. And here they are. You've got hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, chlorine, bromine, and iodine, which I know sounds like a really funky set of elements. And there's two ways that you can remember them. Um, you can either remember Hunkel Fibber, that's the elements uh, abbreviations spelled out, so Hunkel Fibber, or you have what's called the seven up rule. Now the seven up rule is this. If you have my hideous periodic table here, essentially the pattern for these is hydrogen which is up here and then the rest of them form a seven so where the seven up comes from if you can look at a periodic table you get seven up so you've got the seven up rule or you've got Hunkel Fibber and this is just showing you how we find them we find these in pairs so nitrogen chlorine and hydrogen we all find in pairs in nature now for the formation of a covalent bond um, essentially what happens is let me just set this up here. You've got the energy on the y-axis, you've got the intranuclear distance, and there is a way that we get to what's called the bond length, or kind of the happy medium as to where these form. And ultimately you have to look at repulsive and attractive forces. And for repulsive and attractive forces, um, it's kind of like Goldilocks and the Three Bears, that here the molecules, oh, not gonna let me do that. Let's try this again. Um, here the molecules are too close. So the repulsive forces are greater than the attractive. That's what's going on here. Now out here, the attractive forces are greater than the repulsive. And what we want them to do is get to this nice happy medium down here. This is the bond length. That's where they're going to have the lowest potential energy. And this is where the attraction and the repulsion are going to balance out. Okay. Um, the attra and just as a reminder, the attractive forces are going to be between the um, charges that are different, so the uh, protons and the electrons. The repulsive is going to be from the same, where you've got the protons repelling each other and the electrons repelling each other, that's kind of stuff. But that's where why we end up with certain bond lengths. And again, this is just showing you how it forms. Here's the attractive forces I was talking about. You've got your negative electron, your positively charged proton. Your repulsive forces come from the electrons repelling each other as well as the protons attract or repelling each other. So that's where you end up with this kind of balance. And that's what it's going to describe here. Approaching nuclei and electron clouds are attracted to each other in an attempt to decrease potential energy. But you also have the repelling and that lowest energy is going to be the bond length and again where the attractive and the repulsive are equal to each other. They can essentially balance each other out. And so here you go. Distance is reached in which repulsion and attractive forces are equal. Potential energy is at the lowest possible, and it's a bottom of the curve on that PE graph. So you should be familiar with that graph and be able to discuss what happens at all three places. You know, if the, I mean, you should be able to tell me why, but these last three slides kind of spell that out.
All right, now covalent bonds, or bond length rather. You're going to have to write this down because your notes do not say this. Um, the distance between two bonded atoms at their lowest potential energy, it's the average distance since there are some vibrations. No, I'm sorry, it's the next one. It's bond energy that's going to be wrong. Bond length is right. So it's the distance between two bonded ener between two bonded atoms. Again, we have lowest potential energy. It's an average distance because even in the solid form, there are still some vibrations of molecules. They're not totally, totally still. It's measured in picometers. And the stronger the bond, the shorter the bond. Okay, so you need to know this relationship. And this next slide is not for you to memorize. It's just to sh excuse me, show you. If we focus in here on the just the carbon-carbon bonds, um, the single bond, this is a carbon-carbon single bond, has a bond length of 154, a bond energy of 347. The carbon-carbon double bonds, bond length of 134, so it gets shorter, bond energy is 614. Triple bond is going to be the shortest at 120 and the strongest at 839. So it's just re-emphasizing that relationship that the shorter the bond, the stronger the bond. Now this is what you have to write down because your copies were wrong that I gave you guys. Bond energy, the definition, is the energy required to break the bonds in one mole of a chemical compound. The stronger the bond, the higher the bond energy. That's kind of what we were talking about. This is in kilojoules per mole. Okay, kilojoules per mole. And this next slide again is not for you to memorize. It's just all of these bonds have been studied enough. And again, it's an average because they're slightly moving, but the energy required to break those bonds if need be. Okay, ionic bonds do not form molecules. Why? Because you have metals involved. Um, for excuse me, ionic compounds, the chemical formulas are the simplest ratio of the ion types. We've seen this in naming. This is why we always reduce it down either a 1 to 1, a 2 to 1, even a 3 to 1, depending on what we've got, even 3 to 2, you know, different different types. Cation is positive. Anion is going to be negative. I highlighted the T because that's kind of our positive sign. And it's typically a metal cation and a nonmetal anion or it involves one of those polyatomic ions that we talked about when we talked about ionic naming as well. So again, if you have more than, excuse me, two types of atoms, for the purposes of this class, that's when you can go right to thinking that you're dealing with a polyatomic ion. Not always the case, but we simplify it a little bit here. Okay, ionic compounds are combined so that the positive and the negative charges are equal. Okay, they're always equal. That's why when we have, for example, when we combine magnesium and chloride, magnesium, that's a bad two, but it's a two plus. Chloride is a one minus. So when we form that compound, we get MgCl2 so that you end up with two minuses for the chlorides to cancel out the two pluses for the magnesiums. All righty, there we go usually is what we call a crystalline solid or crystal and the formula of the ionic compound depends on the charges of the ions combined which we just saw up there with magnesium chloride now the attractive forces here are a little bit different it's the oppositely charged ions that are pulling them together uh, also the nuclei and the electron clouds of adjacent ions so you have a lot of things try more things trying to pull them together the repulsive forces here are going to be any like similarly charged ions electrons and electrons of adjacent ions. Now for formation, the distance between these ions creates a balance between these forces and ions minimize their potential energy by forming these really orderly arrangement patterns called crystal lattices. And so this orderly arrangement that has the lowest potential energy. So again, we have lowest energy possible, which is what makes atoms happy. It's called these crystal lattice, and they're just these repeating patterns. Um, this one's a pretty straightforward. This is lithium fluoride, where it's a one-to-one, -one, so it's pretty symmetrical. Um, and honestly, for lattice patterns, it's kind of like snowflakes in that they're all different. And it just it depends on two things. It depends on the charges of the ions as well excuse me, is the size of the ions. And there's more math. It's called Coulomb's Law, which we're not going to get into this year. But this is just a couple of examples. And the take-home message is just that they're repeating patterns, but they're different. So you don't really have to know the specifics on those.
Okay, last but not least, you've got metallic bonding. Now, with metallic bonding, the highest energy level for most metal atoms typically does not contain many electrons. Okay, this is where you're getting into either, you know, the S's, and most of them usually have empty, completely empty P blocks, and even slightly empty D blocks, which means that those vacant overlapping orbitals, I've kind of not told you all the truth here, allow those outer electrons to really roam freely around the entire metal. So even though last unit we did these nice pretty electron configurations that everyone liked, they followed the off-bow principle, they went from 1s to 2s to, to 2p, etc. It's not quite the truth, and you don't have to necessarily understand it other than, well you do have to understand it, that those empty orbitals allow the electrons to roam freely. And the electrons are what we refer to as being delocalized, meaning they're not with one specific atom, they kind of roam all the valence electrons um, the outer electrons are allowed. The core ones are going to stick. Everything else is going to move. Okay, the roaming electrons is what we refer to as a sea of electrons. And I'll show you some uh, visualizations of this in class, but essentially you have these cations that are stuck in place and the electrons just travel, all the valence electrons travel around the metal atoms. And they're still packed into a crystal lattice just like they had with ions, with ionic compounds. And metallic bonding formal fancy definition is the bonding that results from the attraction between the metal atoms and the sea of electrons. Okay. Now properties of metal, things we should be familiar with. Conductivity is from the freedom of these electrons to move around the atoms. If those electrons couldn't move, they would not conduct electricity. Um, shininess or luster, the fact that you have all these orbitals with small differences in energy, every time an electron comes down Remember, any time an electron comes down an energy level, it emits a photon of light. So all those little photons of light add up to metals being shiny. Okay, as soon as it comes down, it's going to emit that photon of light. Um, you also have malleability and ductility. Malleability being the ability to be hammered into a thin sheet, ductility pulled into a same in this small wire. This is because the bonding is the same in every direction and one layer of atoms can easily slide past one another without friction. As opposed to if you think back to the ionic compounds, if you think of those as like Lincoln logs, if you pull out one of those connectors, ionic compounds are usually very brittle and they will easily fall apart. So that's kind of one of the differences between ions and metallic bonds. Now for the strength of metallic bond, it will depend on the nuclear charge or the number of protons and it depends on the num essentially the number of electrons in the C, which I know kind of sounds silly, but we do have a term where we can combine um, and study the strength of those bonds, those metallic bonds, particularly when it's even an element, and meaning like it's all copper or it's all iron, and that is the heat of sublimation. And heat of sublimation is the amount of heat required to turn solid bonded metal atoms into gas. So we still have sublimation and this is usually, it's, it's usually in one kilojoules per mole. But we can compare, you know, something with a higher heat of sublimation is going to have stronger bond. Something with a lower heat of sublimation would have a lower bond. Okay? So I hope that helps.